Good morning. So I'm Terry Lynn Thompson. I'm a lecturer in digital media and professional learning here at the University of Stirling. So I'm actually not from digital heritage. Um, but I wanted to set the scene, start off by setting the scene with some, some, some different entry points into thinking about big data and um, social science research. I'm going to start with the sustainable development goals which seem to be galvanizing global action around data. They're a strong feature in recent policy discourse in which the hopes are evident for a positive impact of better data practices and infrastructures on social cohesion and economic prosperity. But however promising the data turn is, current data practices often work on women, making them and what they do visible and invisible in ways that include and exclude. So it's important to ensure that new data practices globally and locally do not further entrench inequities because as starting to come out, I think, in, in this conference, um, data practices are not neutral. And David Beer writes, the way that data is spoken of reveals something of its materiality and agendas, and therefore important to see how data are invented and put to work. So in that respect, I think it's quite important to work with women in a more sort of co-participative way to figure out how they could leverage personal public open data, how they could address data injustices, how they could ensure representation in data, and here I, I specifically mean big and small streams of data of value, and engage in that larger ecosystem of data practices to foster empowerment. David Beer also writes that uh, the opportunities are there for those who can locate value in the volume and source of data. And a provocative question raised by um, these women is how might women leverage and value their data as potential economic or social resource that they're able to exploit themselves or choose to have it exploited by third parties? So I'm, I'm sort of bringing a sort of a critical social science perspective to these kind of questions. If we think, and this is a pretty standard list of all the different kinds of data that's being produced, everything from digital CCTVs to retail checkouts, social media produced by government, but also by um, phone operators, financial institutions, traded between data brokers, held in archives and being converted, um, digitized, and then vast swaths of government data that are being made openly accessible. So my question is that, is where would young women, because that is my interest, um, specifically see themselves in these data streams and processes. Um, and these kinds of data streams are this very interesting intermingling of small and big data to the point I don't know if I really understand the difference anymore between big and small. Like I know there's definitions, but I think it's getting a little bit mixed up. But there's all sorts of personal, public, open, inaccessible, private, commercial, official, unofficial data. and interested in how young women are implicated in this kind of data, how they could maybe want to influence or leverage some of it, and how they could also be data makers. Um, so these are questions that a small group of us are um, working on, thinking about new ways that we could sort of theorize some of this, but also sort of new avenues for empirical research. Um, and so we're really trying to work to figure out how um, we could develop and amplify the agency and voices of young women in low-income countries and specifically Africa with respect to data practices. So how they can so, sort of locate these data streams of interest, how they can learn to work with them, um, and how they can engage critically and question them and then use them to sort of advance their life opportunities. So a few caveats here today. Um, my focus is on women aged 18 to 35, and that's youth sort of in the broadest UN sense. Um, it's in the global south, but these issues are relevant to men, and many of them are, are relevant in, in many other aspects of the world. And I do not also pretend to sort of speak for women of Africa. Um, but you know, I base that on um, my experience as a researcher and practitioner, and also the work that I've done um, sort of doing international development. So the question you may very well be asking is how does this relate to digital heritage? Um, so I wanted to start with a story. And this is, um, is anyone familiar with this project? It was a, a body mapping uh, project done through a community outreach process led by the University of Cape Town. Um, 
And women were invited to tell their stories as a way of documenting their lives as HIV positive um, women. And they created these life-size body maps that traced contours of their body. And then working with artists, they filled in these body, their body maps with painted representations of, of, um, of HIV AIDS and the virus and, and various kinds of marks and wounds. Um, and also textual fragments. But a lot of this was to bring the, ma the materiality of that lived experience of illness um, to the fore. And there have been various sort of papers written by this. And these collections of body maps have act actually circulated to the world. They've been sort of, um, sort of shown in, in many sort of um, galleries. And this got us wondering about the stories that we tell about data and the stories that data tells about us and wondering what each of our body outlines might look like if they were filled in with, our, with how we're being represented by data or big data um, and what that lived experience of datification really looks like. So the, the kind of influences I draw on are, are socio-material and more than human theorizing, critical data studies, anthropological approaches to materiality and some of Boucher's work on technography. Um, and, and with an idea of trying to attune to how people are living with, through, in, and outside their data and that sort of commingling of past, present, and future when inevitably happens. And perhaps get a sense of how people may be able to narrate their individual and collective digital heritages and the implications then of being included or excluded from some of these kind of data assemblages. I do come from a very specific theoretical perspective, so I just wanted to, to um, introduce that for a minute. Since Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, post-human scholarship has inter you know, um, introduced a very fundamental challenge to how we envision the human and its relational surround. Um, it's about rethinking humans as sort of more than human. It's not about I think the word post-human sometimes is unfortunate. Um, it's not about sort of relinquishing our humanity and letting machines take over, but it's pushing beyond these very human-centric notions to a much more humble um, and hybrid conception of human actions in the world. So it does attend to things. Um, and it offers a way to reckon with our intimate relationship with things, to reconsider agency, and question the presumed neutrality of things. And, and for things here today, we can be thinking about data, big data, data processes. Um, so provoked by ecological crisis and early feminist studies, posthumanism found a sure footing in the digital, um, as it is a way to sort of address some of our entanglements with these technologies. I think that it does offer a way to provide a more inclusive account of what it means to be human in an increasingly technology-mediated world. And so that interest in the who, what, as opposed to just the who or what. And so I was interested in, in what you had to say about where is the human subject or the human in, in some of these sort of um, big swaths of data that we're interested in. So actor network theory is, is one perspective that works in a post-humanist vein, very much interested in things, assemblages, and practices. And for those of you who don't know anything about actor network, you, you might not after like 60 seconds of me talking about it. But just to give you sort of a highlight of it, um, instead of examining only human actors' skills and their relations, a socio-material view treats social and material elements of knowledge practices, and here it could be any kind of practices, digital heritage practices, um, for example, as entangled and mutually constitutive. Materiality is highlighted the way that bodies, substances, settings, and objects combine to actually embed uh, knowledge, learning, digital heritage, or, and exert political influence. The, the challenge for researchers is a way, as Pickering writes, of being able to see double, being able to see the human and the non-human at once, and in our case, our interest in sort of the digital without trying to strip either away. So if you can kind of move towards that, then you've moved towards a more sort of post-humanist perspective. And that's something that I have engaged with with a colleague from Canada around how we can interview digital objects and sort of thinking about our, our entanglements in this post-human world. So with that theoretical framing in mind, I wanted to then consider how the notion of data bodies could be used as a heuristic for activist-oriented research and to challenge conceptually and particularly ontological thinking about big data and digital heritage. 
So a socio-material understanding of data bodies would view this as an assemblage, a mix of global and local actors and a myriad of practices. And what happens here is that people and data are caught up in this very co-constitutive relationship of becoming together. And that also builds a lot on Tim Ingold's work, who is an anthropologist. Um, and as Sarah Pink and colleagues write, everyday life then emerges from this continually shifting digital material configurations. So the idea of a data body is not new, but it is evolving, and I do think it's something that we could be working on. So recent work suggests that it's possible to not only shape and learn with your data body, but also to work with these things to do and be in this world. So in this sense, data bodies are not separate from human bodies. Each is enacting the other. Um, so earlier work seemed to view the data body, some of you might have um, recognized, and these things all mean slightly different things, but similar, that, you know, your data doppelganger, your data shadow, your data double, there's ads on TV where one guy's talking to his data double, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the problem with some of those is they represent this data body as fixed, as, you know, the property of large commercial organizations, and therefore very much a separate construction beyond the, the reach of the individual. And while I think that that still does apply, data bodies are a form of digital materiality, which, as Pink suggests, are very much an emergent process. Yes, they are very partial and... and, and um, representations and constructions, but as Deborah Lupton has written, um, these kinds of um, data assemblages invite different thinkings about the relationship, and I'm not sure where the bottom of my slide is cutting off, but the relationship between data and human bodies. And an interesting study was done by um, Cote and colleagues where they took large swaths of biometric data and figured out how they could make this kind of data life-size and touchable to people. Um, and they used a system called sweat atoms. And 3D printers were used to convert physical activity data into actual artifacts that could be touched and held by people. So for example, the flower that you see here, um, people would wear heart rate monitors and had various sort of other digital devices connected to them. The, the, so, the length of the, the petal on the flower indicates um, your heart rate. And the width of the petal indicates how long you maintained that heart rate. The frog captures the size of your physical activity for that day. So you could have a big frog or a little frog, depending on what you did. And, it, and it, that actually ended up being the most popular one of all was the frog. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting example, perhaps not totally environmentally friendly for people to be printing these things out every day. Um, <coughs> but what was very interesting about this is the way participants were able to manipulate the data by using their bodies differently. They exercised more, their heart rate increased, the, the shape and size of these artifacts changed. And what stands out here is that they're not passive actors. Um, there's this sort of dynamic interconnection between the body and the data body. And in both cases, the sort of interplay between big and small data becomes meaningfully woven into the everyday. So if any of you have a Fitbit or something like that, you get visualizations from that. But I think there's something to hold on to here about this kind of data materialization, especially when so much big data is very ephemeral and, and abstract, and we're wondering how we connect that to our lives. In her analysis of our arteriosclerosis, Anne-Marie Moll, who's an ant scholar, describes sort of disease as this disease in, in her study as, as two objects. One enacted in the talk that happened between a doctor and a patient in a clinic room, and the other that happened in a pathology lab. And she argues that this disease takes different forms. It isn't just <coughs> different perspectives, but in fact, different realities. So, um, you know, the body singular is actually multiple. And her work here really was very leading in terms of thinking within actor network theory about mul multiplicities. And she uses the notion of many foldedness. And I wondered what would happen if we started to think about the many foldedness of our data and our human bodies and the intersections, the fractures, and the contradictions that come out of that. So there was a project based largely in the US that, that started to, to sort of examine this sort of relationship. It was called Our Data Bodies. Interestingly enough, funded out of a trust that was set up by Facebook because they had been naughty and had been fined lots of money for privacy invasions, and so they had to fund good works. Um, and so this was one of the projects that came out of that. 
Um, it's an ongoing project. It's been going for a few years. It was a research justice project to study the impact of data-driven systems and marginalized people. So there was three kinds of data. One was the re-entry data that gets generated when people leave prison and return to their communities and how that impacted their search for employment. The data trail that you generate through your your day-to-day -day interactions with local government and then the um, the experiences of foreclosure, evictions, utility shutoffs, and then the kind of data and digital surveillance that happens around the experience of shelter and homelessness and houselessness. So we're talking, you know, marginalized people um, and, and sort of issues. And one of the things that came out from this was how the participants felt very boxed in or boxed out by the limited opportunities to self-define in, in data-based life. And what this project does, and if you go to the website, they have now created various um, tools that, that can be used sort of for community-based activism and education. And you know, this is starting to move us into the realm of considering how this notion of data bodies invites us to consider how it is part of the making and shaping of bodies, but how the body itself is a site of data politics. And I think when I think heritage, I think that there is definitely a political aspect to heritage and how that is reinterpreted or interpreted or understand in the, in the present day and going forward. So to close, I want to close with the notion of, of data controversies. So Jonathan Gray advocates studying data controversies to um, think about ways that we could be reshaping the processes of datification. New vocabularies of data speak, new repertoires of data work, so that different publics have actually the required literacies to align these processes to their interests. And I think here, I am also speaking about researchers, because I think most of us do need some new vocabularies of data speak and new repertoires of data work as well. So um, I draw on this notion of proactive data activism, because this is, this is largely what this fits into. You, the use of data infrastructures to facilitate innovative alliances, strategies, and actions, in contrast to reactive um, data activism, which is just resisting sort of big data movements. This is actually working with these data assemblages, not only as objects of interest, but as a, a means by which to affect change. So I wanted to sort of pose the idea, first of all, of the non-expert in the everyday. And here I mean the non-expert data scientist. Um, so Kennedy argues the importance of taking into account what non-expert citizens themselves would say would enable them to live better with data based on their everyday experiences of datification. And surprisingly, we don't do hardly any research on this. Um, so, you know, I think there is an opportunity here. A couple of options would be things like mini publics, which actually um, have been taken up with quite a lot of enthusiasm in Scotland um, as a, as a co-participative um, approach of assembly of citizens brought together to learn and deliberate on a topic. That's kind of what happened in the Data bot Bodies Project. And these data study groups at the Alan Turing Institute, has anyone ever done one of these? So they're meant to be a five-day intensive collaborative hackathon where a bunch of stakeholders are brought in, challenge owners provide real-world problems, and then this team, amazing team, gets to work, and by the end of the week, there's supposedly all sorts of solutions presented. And I think that, that there are some things about this that I, I really quite like as a model. Um, but what we have here is just the idea of the learning piece that becomes definitely part of this. The second data controversy is that paradoxically broken data itself may create opportunities. If we think about some of the data injustices, and I return to my sort of original theme, women differently present and absence in data streams, better data infrastructures do not fix problems with past and current data in terms of who or what is represented and how. And I heard this time and time again from my African colleagues. Yes, we can have better algorithms, albeit imported from the north, um, but if women aren't even represented in the data that we're applying those better algorithms to, we really haven't advanced things. Um, unrecognized biases in algorithms and algorithmic profiling that sometimes can reproduce inequities, and how particular data and people come to be attached to each other, meaningfully or not meaningfully. And Sarah Pink has argued that when data is incomplete, inconsistent, and broken, that actually opens up a space for discussion. And that it's important sometimes to maintain these differences rather than resolve them. And in this way, you have an opportunity to follow what actually happens after the breakage and see the kind of repair work that comes on. Um, 
And so I wanted to end just with this thought, because this is a, a big theme in, in sort of data justice and data injustice, is who owns one's data. And I wonder, what are the implications if data is not something a person owns but is? Um, Floridi argues that you are your information, and in this sense, you cannot give it away. And I think that is really further challenging a lot of our notions about the data double as something that's very static and separate. So he argues that my and my information is not the same as my car, but really it's the same as my as in my body or my feelings, a, a sense of constitutive belonging, not of external ownership. Um, it's part of me and it's not sort of a legal possession. So an ontological pause, something you can think about at lunch or perhaps with a drink, but um, I do think that these are the kinds of questions that um, as we're talking about big data in whatever field that we're interested in talking about, start to highlight different questions. And I think part of this is being respectful of things and of data in particular tell their histories, what they do, what happens to them when treated in particular ways in the very practice of working with them. And I'll end there.